Live from New Delhi, you watching DD India News R, India's voice to the world. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. Coming up in the next hour. Well, world leaders rush to de-escalate Iran-Israel tension. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken dials Turkish, Chinese, Saudi counterparts. Tel Aviv says prepared and on high alert. South Korea, Japan and United States hold naval drills amid North Korea threats. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi reaches out to masses with his government's achievements on economic and foreign policy front. PM says opposition is certain of its defeat in the general elections. An exodus to Thailand continues after fall of key Myanmar border town. Anti-Hunta resistance claim control of Myawadi town. As tensions in West Asia escalates, Tehran's envoy to the UN claims that if the UN Security Council had denounced the attack, the imperative for Iran to retaliate on it for its diplomatic compound in Damascus may have been averted. Iran has signaled to Washington that it will not act impulsively in response to Israel's attack on Syrian embassy. Iran will instead attempt to prevent a significant escalation as Tehran presses demands including a Gaza truce. Reportedly, Iran's message to Washington was conveyed by Iranian foreign minister during a visit on Sunday to the Gulf Arab state of Oman, which has often acted as an intermediary between Tehran and Washington. The diplomatic messaging points to a cautious approach by Iran as it weighs how to respond to the April 1st attack in a way that deters Israel from further such actions but avoids a military escalation. Meanwhile, Israel said it has been bracing for possible Iranian retaliation for the killing of a senior general and six other Iranian officers in an airstrike in Damascus on April 1st. We are prepared both defensively and offensively in a variety of capacities of the army. An attack from Iran's territory will be solid proof of Iran's intention to escalate in the Middle East and stop hiding behind its proxies. And US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has engaged in talks with his Turkish, Chinese and Saudi Arabian counterparts amid concerns that Iran will strike Israel in retaliation for a strike in Damascus. During the talks, the US has expressed its concern towards the tensions in West Asia and made clear that escalation in the region is not in anyone's interest. I don't have any calls to announce, but we have been engaged in a series of, of contacts, not just at his level, but at other levels too, to talk to foreign okay. counterparts to send this very clear message to Iran that they should not escalate this conflict. We continue to be concerned about the risk of escalation in the Middle East, uh, something we have been working to mitigate and contain since the attacks of October 7th, uh, and specifically about the threats made in recent days by Iran against the state of Israel and the Israeli people. Well, the White House has affirmed the U.S. ironclad commitment to Israel security and asserted that U.S. was not involved in the Damascus strike. Top U.S. commander for the Middle East General Eric Kurila is in Israel for talks on security threats with country's military officials. We've been very clear about that. And uh, we've been very clear uh, that uh, it's in, you know, to Iran that we're not involved in the Damascus strike, right? We've been also very clear. I'm not going to get into public back and forth. We communicated to Iran that the U.S. had no involvement uh, in the strike. All right, and uh, Didi India's Ishan Gurk joins us live from Brussels for more, Ishan. Uh, tell us about the latest happening in the Middle East and how is the world reacting to it? Well, tensions have, of course, once again flared up in the Middle East. They have been flaring up since the October 7th attacks on Israel. And now it seems to be looking as if the entire uh, area is uh, some sort of a powder keg because you've got the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels launching strikes uh, uh, 
saying that they support the Palestinian cause and at the same time you've got world leaders from Germany, from the UK and also from Russia asking Iran to not escalate tensions. In the most recent press conference by the German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock, she said that any sort of escalation in this territory could have, uh, could have dire consequences for the entire area of the Middle East and uh, they have been asking Iran to tone down the pressure a little bit. Uh, the British Foreign Secretary David Cameron has said that the possibility of a miscalculation or some sort of a misstep in this area could have very dire consequences and therefore they are trying uh, to reduce the pressure a little bit. But at the same time we haven't heard anything from the European Union which has been a big critic of Iran. So of course pressure here is rising uh, in Brussels on the European Union to uh, issue some sort of a statement uh, 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 addressing this potential a uh, big pressure situation in the Middle East. All right, Ishan, uh, what more do we know about the attack itself, you know, that claimed 13 lives and created an uproar? Well, there isn't a lot of information available, but from what we understand, that it was one of the biggest and uh, most deadliest attacks that have occurred in this region. And it has certainly uh, flared up the tensions in that area. We've seen from Israel comments coming in saying that it's making necessary security preparations, which mm. certainly has a bit of a uh, gloomy feel to that uh, feel to that conversation, to that those sort of comments. And we've also heard from Iran saying that uh, this quote-unquote rogue uh, uh, government, this rogue uh, authority needs to be put under control and that's how we are seeing this sort of tensions uh, coming uh, from the Middle Eastern part. All right, we leave it there. Thank you so much, Ishan, for joining in and uh, for your analysis. Well, amid the growing tensions in the Middle East, Russia, Germany and Britain have called for restraint from all sides. Russia urged its citizens to avoid travel to the Middle East, especially to Israel, Lebanon and the Palestinian territories. Meanwhile, German airline Lufthansa extended its suspension of flights to Tehran. This follows Iran's Israel's declaration of preparedness to address security threats as the region braces for a potential Iranian attack. Well, the UN Security Council has failed to reach consensus on the Palestinians' bid for full UN membership. Aiming for international recognition of their statehood, Palestinians have lobbied for full UN membership for years. Palestine currently holds observer status at the world body since 2012. Any request to become a UN member state must first pass through the Security Council, where Israel's ally, the United States, wields a veto and then be endorsed by the General Assembly. All the U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan is set to visit India next week on 17th of April. The U.S. National Security aide will meet his Indian counterpart Ajit Duval and review progress under the Initiative for Critical and Emerging Technology, which was jointly launched by Prime Minister Modi and President Joe Biden in the year 2022. The top-level engagement will also focus on the India-U.S. relationship and talk about the next steps in technology cooperation. All right, and still to come on DD in the news are Russian missiles and drones destroy a large electricity plant near Kiev. In wake of the Arizona Supreme Court's ruling on abortion rights, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris is visiting Tucson. South Korea, Japan, U.S. hold naval drills at sea amid North Korea threats. Opposition stuns Erdogan with historic victory in Turkish local port. Will the defeat force Erdogan to reset his foreign policy? Will artificial intelligence enslave humans? And crypto king Sam Bankman Fried will grow old in jail. So, what lessons should we learn from his conviction? Watch Connecting the Dots to get the full picture every Friday at 8 pm IST on DD India. <laughs>
Regional parties call the shots in the northeast. Will local issues play high over national issues? What are the issues that matter in Mizoram, Nagaland, Tripura and Manipur? On the Great Indian Election on Friday at 8:30 p.m. IST and 1500 <coughs> hours GMT only on DD India. You're watching DD News R. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. On Russia-Ukraine conflict updates, Russian missiles and drones destroyed a large electricity plant near Kiev and hit power facilities in several regions of Ukraine on Thursday, completely destroying the Tripolsk coal power thermal power plant near the capital. <coughs> Ukrainian authorities on Friday confirmed the attack in southern Ukraine that caused fire at an energy facility in Dnipropetrovsk and damaged critical infrastructure in Kherson region. The fire was caused by the drone debris. Ukraine also confirmed the use of one KH-59 guided air missile by Russia. Ukraine shot down 16 out of 17 drones. Well, meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin said Russia had been obliged to launch strikes in response to Kyiv's attacks on Russian targets. Unfortunately, we observed a series of strikes on our energy sites recently and were obliged to respond. I want to emphasize that even for humanitarian reasons, we did not carry out any strikes in winter. What I mean is that we didn't want to leave social institutions without power, hospitals and the like. But after a series of attacks on our power facilities, we had to respond. Well, UN nuclear watchdog chief Rafael Grossi said direct attacks against Zaporizhia nuclear power plant marked the major escalation of the nuclear safety and security dangers in Ukraine. Speaking at the special meeting of the agency's 35 nation board of governors on Thursday, Grossi called for maximum restraint to prevent a nuclear accident and ensure the integrity of the ZNPP. He said Sunday's attack fortunately did not compromise nuclear safety in serious way but it would be irresponsible for us to assume future attacks will not On Sunday direct attacks against the Saporizhia nuclear power plant marked a major escalation of the nuclear safety and security dangers in Ukraine significantly increasing the risk of a nuclear accident The most recent attacks however are a clear violation of the principles and have shifted us into an acutely consequential juncture in this war. Well UN chief will meet with the UN Security Council next week. And Russia on Friday stated that its air defense forces shot down five Ukrainian drones. Four drones were destroyed over Russia's Rostov region and one over Belgorod region. Ukraine made an overnight attack on targets in different regions inside Russia. Now Ukraine takes action to deal with the acute soldier shortage as its conflict with Russia grinds into its third year. Parliament passed a legislation on Thursday to simplify conscription, aiding an expected mobilization that could press hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian men into battlefield. Ukraine has been suffering setbacks on the battlefield against Russia. <laughs> The new measures should increase troop numbers by requiring men to update their draft data with the authorities boosting payments to those who volunteer and letting some convicts serve. The bill requires President Zelensky's signature to become law. All right and uh, Didi Nya's Dasha Chernyshova joins us live from Moscow Dasha. Now Apparently Russian missiles and drones destroyed a large electricity plant near Kyiv. How do you analyze the situation where Russia is targeting the energy infrastructure in several regions of Ukraine? Well, the statements coming from Moscow suggest that those are the attacks uh, with two uh, reasons. The first one is in response to the Ukrainian attacks against the oil refineries inside Russia that Moscow said it would not leave unanswered so here is this response by the Russian Federation the second reason that was explained by the president uh, Vladimir Putin uh, on Thursday is that Moscow is still demilitarizing Ukraine
Ukraine and it is part of the wider process of demilitarization which was described as one of the goals of Russia's so-called special military operation in Ukraine. So Moscow insists that it is uh, striking the energy facilities of Ukraine as part of its operation uh, to prevent the Ukrainian military from their capacity to produce and to restore the military equipment that is later used to attack Russia or the Russian soldiers on the battlefield. The Russian president also noted that uh, Russia was refraining from the attacks against the energy facilities of Ukraine throughout winter and that was done for the humanitarian purposes with Moscow saying that it wanted uh, didn't want to inflict significant damage on the civilians and with Moscow constantly saying that what it is doing in Ukraine is related only to the military complex of Ukraine it is not targeting the civilian population also uh, amidst everything which is happening Dasha how has Ukraine responded to these strikes what is Ukraine saying will they retaliate Well, what we understand is from the analysis of the Russian political scientists and military analysts is that Ukraine continues to attack Russia with its drones against the backdrop of uh, failures on the battlefield. And this is also the position of the Russian officials. So the understanding in Moscow is that Ukraine will continue to uh, use those attacks by Russia against the military industrial complex to ask for more weapons that would be later used against Russia and Russia in response will continue to eliminate those weapons on the Ukrainian territory. So that does look like the vicious circle from what we're hearing from the uh, analysts here in Russia. And the understanding now is that the sides uh, are more inclined to get to the negotiating table. Uh, in the meeting that President Vladimir Putin held with his Belarusian counterpart Alexander Lukashenko in Moscow on Thursday, the issue of peace negotiations was touched upon with the two saying that the Istanbul agreements that were reached in spring 2022 uh, could be taken as the basis for further talks rather than any peace plan proposed by the Ukrainian president Vladimir Zelensky. But obviously those arrangements are now outdated because two years have passed and the geopolitical reality has changed. So they could serve as the basis and uh, be further negotiated by the two sides. But Moscow once again stresses that it was Ukraine that outlawed the possibility of negotiations with Moscow. All right, uh, Dasha, Russia and Kazakhstan, they are battling record floods. Uh, you stay with us, I'll come back to you on this. Well, Russia and Kazakhstan continue to battle record floods as rivers rise further. The village of Kamenskoye in Russia's Kurgan region was being evacuated on Friday morning after the water level then rose 1.4 meters overnight. Kamenskoye is a settlement along the Tobol River, which also flows through the regional center Kurgan, a city of 300,000 people. In the city of Orenburg, water levels crossed 11 meters on Friday. Similar scenes are being witnessed across northern Kazakhstan. A state of emergency remained in effect in eight affected regions of the country, evacuating almost 98,000 people. Emergency workers have so far removed 8.8 .8 million cubic meters of water from flooded areas. The deluge of meltwater has forced over 120,000 people from their homes in Russia's rural mountains, Siberia and Kazakhstan. Well, uh, DD Net correspondent Dasha Chernyshova is still with us. Dasha, uh, could you give us some updates as Russia and Kazakhstan continue to battle record floods as rivers rise further? Well, the peak of the flooding in the city of Orenburg is today and the understanding is that several uh, districts of the city are in the risk of being flooding. But as the local emergency ministry says, it is not as bad as it was in Orsk where the flooding has been even more severe also because of the dam burst. So the understanding now is that in some parts of the Orenburg region, such as in Orsk, water has started to recede from several uh, hundred 
hundreds of households and buildings, water level, uh, water has completely left. But obviously in Orenburg, the peak is today and the authorities are doing what they can to make sure that the civilians are not in the risks of the flooding. But water levels continue to grow elsewhere in Russia into main region. The peak of the flooding is expected on the 23rd and the 25th, between the 23rd and the 25th of April. In Kurgan, more residents are being evacuated uh, from the areas that are expected to be flooded as well. So the situation is very acute. The Russian president is constantly, as we understand uh, from the statements of the Kremlin, constantly in contact with the local governors, with the emergency minister, as well as with the reconstruction minister. Uh, he urged the Russian authorities to think preventively about the reconstruction effort, because those are not just the households, not just the buildings that are being damaged because of the flooding, but the infrastructure that people use, the roads that are uh, completely destroyed by this water. So a lot of effort will have to be made in order to make sure that residents in those territories get back to the normal life as soon as possible. Thank you so much, Dasha, for joining in and for your analysis. All right, and staying with Europe, Britain's tepid economy is on course to exit a shallow recession after output grew for a second month in a row in February and January's reading was revised higher. According to official data, gross domestic product expanded by 0.1% in monthly terms in February, as expected in a Reuters poll of economists. January's reading was revised to show growth of 0.3%, up from 0.2% earlier. The data confirmed Britain's economy started 2024 on a stronger footing, with a three-month average growth rate rising to 0.2% in February from zero in January, the highest such reading since August. The figures are also likely to reinforce the Bank of England's cautious tone around the prospect for interest rate cuts, with the economy on track to slightly exceed the central bank's expectation for a 0.1% expansion in the first quarter. All right, and U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris will visit Arizona today, just days after the state's top court reinstated a law from 1864, criminalizing and banning abortions in nearly all circumstances. Abortion has become a central issue in the 2024 elections. And as Tony Waterman explains, the Biden administration is wasting no time in politically capitalizing on this latest extreme ban and laying the blame at Donald Trump's feet. This trip to Arizona wasn't even on the vice president's schedule late last week. And now it is an official campaign event headlined as a fight for reproductive freedoms. Kamala Harris is visiting Tucson, which is Arizona's second largest city. And while there, she is expected to blast this state Supreme Court decision and blame former president Donald Trump, who appointed the conservative justices to the U.S. Supreme Court that overturned Roe v. Wade two years ago, returned turning abortion access to the states. This 160-year-old law in Arizona, which existed before women had the right to vote and before Arizona was even a state, will be one of the most extreme abortion laws when it is reinstated in about two weeks. Doctors will face up to five years in prison if they perform an abortion. The only exception is to save the life of the mother, but there are no clear guidelines on what constitutes a medical emergency. And in other states with similar bans, doctors have refused to perform the procedure for fear of breaking the law, and in some cases, that has jeopardized the lives of women. Friday's trip to Arizona will be Harris's second in the span of a month, which is an indication of just how important this state is going to be in the 2024 elections. Out of all the battleground states, Joe Biden won Arizona by the thinnest margin in 2020, and current polls show him trailing behind his Republican rival, Donald Trump. Polls, though, also show that abortion is a top issue for voters, the vast majority of which support abortion access. So Democrats are hoping that this latest ban will galvanize voters and Kamala Harris's trip is all about doing just that. Tony Waterman in Austin, Texas, reporting for DD India. All right, another news from the United States where the Federal Bureau of Investigation is concerned about the possibility of an organized attack in the United States. 
similar to the one that killed scores of people at a Russian concert hall last month. FBI director told the House of Representatives panel on Thursday that the attack might be carried out by an individual or small group inspired by the conflict between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. A March 22nd attack on a concert hall in a Moscow suburb killed at least 144 people, the deadliest in Russia in 20 years. A branch of the Islamic State terrorist group claimed responsibility, but Russian President Vladimir Putin, without citing evidence, has sought to blame Ukraine. All right, and Japan's Kishida addresses the U.S. Congress after U.S. President Joe Biden hosted him and Philippines President for a trilateral. Long simmering tensions between China and its neighbors took center stage at the meet, where three leaders pushed back on Beijing's stepped up pressure on Manila in the disputed South China Sea. The United States defense commitments to Japan and to the Philippines are ironclad. They are ironclad. As I've said before, any attack on Philippine aircraft, vessels, or armed forces in the South China Sea would invoke our mutual defense treaty. We seek to identify ways of growing our economies and making them more resilient, climate-proofing our, our cities and our societies, sustaining our development progress, and forging a peaceful world, world for the next. In order to secure peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific, I hope to reaffirm our intention to further strengthen trilateral cooperation and to present the specific way forward through today's meeting. And China's foreign ministry summoned a Japanese diplomat on Friday. Beijing expressed grave concern and strong dissatisfaction over alleged negative comments regarding China at the recent trilateral summit between the US, Japan and the Philippines. All right, and shifting focus to Asia Pacific, Myanmar citizens queed at border to crossing to flee to Thailand early on Friday, a day after Myanmar witnessed brutal attacks that has been growing in strength. Daily, more than 4,000 residents on Myanmar's border have fled to neighboring Thailand, fearing for their safety after hearing the sound of aerial bombing. Thai Foreign Minister Bahida Nukara is scheduled to visit May Sot from Myawadi later on Friday to assess the situation. And South Korea, Japan and the United States staged long-planned joint naval exercises involving an American aircraft carrier to ensure readiness against nuclear and missile threats from North Korea. The two-day drills held in international waters brought together the USS Theodore Roosevelt and the destroyers Howard, Russell and Daniel Inouye. The South Korean Navy said that during the training, a multi-year joint exercise plan was set up after last year's three-way summit. North Korea has been accelerating weapons development and leader Kim Jong-un said on Wednesday that now was the time to be more prepared for war than ever. China's Coast Guard said on Friday that it patrolled the territorial waters of Dio Islands, also known in Japan as the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea. Japan Coast Guard said it marked the 10th such instance by Chinese vessels this year. The waters around the islands are disputed and claimed by both China and Japan. The two sides have phased off in the waters, deploying patrol boats and urging the other to leave the area. All right, still to come on DD in the news hour. We will do a deep analysis as tensions rise in the Middle East. We will get you the latest on world's largest democratic election in India. NIA detains two suspects from West Bengal in connection with the blast at a cafe in India's Rameshwaram. Opposition stunts Erdogan with historic victory in Turkish local court. Will the defeat force Erdogan to reset his foreign policy? Will artificial intelligence enslave humans? And crypto king Sam Bankman-Fried will grow old in jail 
सो वॉट लेसन शुड बी लर्न फ्रॉम हिस्स कन्विक्शन वॉच कनेक्टिंग द डॉट्स टू गेट द फुल पिक्चर एवरी फ्राइडे एट एट पी एम आई एस टी ऑन डी डी इंडिया रीजनल पार्टीज कॉल द शॉट्स इन द नॉर्थ ईस्ट विल लोकल इश्यूज प्ले हाई ओवर नेशनल इश्यूज वॉट आर द इश्यूज दैट मैटर इन मिजोराम नागालैंड त्रिपुरा एंड मणिपुर ऑन द ग्रेट इंडियन इलेक्शन ऑन फ्राइडे एट एट थर्टी पी एम आई एस टी एंड फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड आवर्स जी एम टी ओनली ऑन डी डी इंडिया वेर एवर न्यूज ब्रेक्स वट एवर इट टेक्स Connecting corners, cutting across continents. Stories that matter from across the globe. Accurate, authentic journalism that serves you right. From politics to glamour, from sports to world affairs, with a fusion of aesthetics and substance. Introducing news in a new avatar. Experience the world through a new lens. Stay tuned to DD India for an exciting journey beyond borders. All right, you're watching DD India News on. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. World leaders rush to de-escalate Iran-Israel tension. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken dials Turkish, Chinese, Saudi counterparts. Tel Aviv says prepare and on high alert. South Korea, Japan and United States hold naval drills amid North Korea threats. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi reaches out to masses with his government's achievements on economic and foreign policy front. PM says opposition is certain of its defeat in the general elections. And exodus to Thailand continues after fall of key Myanmar border town. Anti-Hunda resistance claim control of Myawadi town. All right, you're watching the Indian News. Are now going back to our earlier stories. We are joined by our guest Ashok Sajjanar. He's a former senior diplomat, sir. I really appreciate your time joining us uh, on the broadcast. Uh, disturbing news out from the Middle East. What's your take on the current situation where Israel is bracing for a potential attack from Iran? Seems like it's not a matter of if, but when. Yeah, I think that is the million dollar question, Siddharth, uh, where and when, because uh, after the attack on the 1st of April, which uh, uh, Israel has not claimed, but it is stated that it is Israel is behind that attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria, uh, Iran has uh, vowed to take uh, revenge, to take uh, action against uh, Israel. It has said that our territory has been attacked. and we are also going to attack uh, them in a similar measure and in uh, response the israeli defense minister yav galant has also said that if we are attacked from iran so we will also attack iranian territory so this has a potential of uh, this whole conflagration this whole conflict getting out of hand it has been going on now for the last 6 uh, months and it has been the intention of all major responsible global powers that uh, this uh, conflict should end as quickly as possible and in any case it should not expand and uh, two days ago on the south lawns of the white house president uh, uh, joe biden while welcoming uh, the japanese prime minister fumio kishida he said that the united states commitment for the security of israel is ironclad so this is uh, basically sending out a very strong message to iran that it should not contemplate it should not think of attacking israel directly because in that case it is going to come in direct uh, conflict with the united states also but uh, you know at the moment uh, what it appears is that over the last 6 months when this israel hamas conflict started this is the moment when uh, uh, an uh, uh, expansion of the conflagration appears uh, most uh, likely so it is uh, Uh, what uh, the world powers need to do is to clamp down and that is what you said that uh, there are uh, anthony blinken is in uh, uh, the region and other 
uh, global leaders are in the region to try and uh, calm tempers. Siddharth. All right. Uh, sir, the White House has affirmed the U.S. ironclad commitment to Israel security. Do you think the state will still dare to launch attack? And if so, what do you think, what form it could be? I mean, would it be direct or via one of its proxies? Yeah, that is what it appears. You know, Iranian proxies have been, of course, active in the region in more ways than one. Hamas, it is very well known, is an Iranian proxy. So the attack on the 7th of October was either with or without the knowledge, but definitely with the connivance of Iran. Okay. After that, we have seen uh, Hezbollah attacking from the northern parts of uh, Israel. But uh, Hezbollah has uh, more than, it is reported, it has more than 100,000 missiles and uh, rockets, and they have a range that could reach even to the south of Israel. Okay. So the, that is a much more powerful force as compared to Hamas. Hmm. And we've seen that the Houthis have also been active, whether hmm. it is in terms of uh, bombing the shipping in the Red Sea through yeah. missiles, Bab el Mandeb Strait, or even Arabian Sea. Hmm. So it is a moot point as to where the attack will come and when it will come. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think it'll be, it is quite unlikely, although uh, Imam Khamenei, the hmm. leader, the religious leader of Iran, has said at least twice in this week, that we are going to punish uh, Israel. Hmm. But still, it would appear uh, somewhat unlikely that Iran would uh, launch a direct uh, attack against uh, Israel because it does not have the capacity or capability to withstand the combined force of Israel and the United States. So maybe it is going to be uh, upping the ante further through its other proxies like uh, Hezbollah, Hama, uh, no, Houthis, Hmm. And also, it could happen if the attack could take place on some of the uh, Israeli embassies in different parts of the world. And Israel has uh, been taking action to ramp up its security in different regions, in different uh, capitals. It has even closed down some of its embassies uh, so that uh, they don't come under fire from uh, Israeli uh, proxies or Israeli uh, uh, actions. Okay, uh, Mr. Sajanar. Iran has signaled to Washington that it will not act impulsively in response to Israel's attack. What do you make out of this statement? What do you make out of this particular statement by, uh, by uh, Iran? Yeah, you know what Iran is uh, thereby communicating, you would recall, uh, Siddharth, that uh, the IRGC, the Pasdaran commander of uh, Iran, hmm. was uh, killed, uh, 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 General uh, Soleimani, hmm. was killed in January of 2020 in uh, Iraq and Baghdad by a missile strike from Israel. And it is uh, said that the October 7th attack by Hamas was really a revenge by Iran against Israel for this uh, uh, attack uh, which had killed uh, uh, Soleimani. Hmm. So it took them uh, uh, two, three years, more than uh, three and a half years to really uh, avenge this particular killing of uh, General Soleimani. So here also the warnings have come, but uh, I think uh, Iran is not going to take such a long time in uh, going out uh, and uh, uh, you know trying to avenge this uh, attack on its consulate in Damascus. It might take some time because preparations would be required. And as I said, it is more likely that some of its uh, proxies are going to be used in launching this attack rather than in uh, going directly against uh, Israel itself. Siddharth. Okay, uh, sir, also, uh, you know, the United States has restricted travel for its employees in Israel amid fears of an attack by Iran. Do you think the attack is imminent? All right, we are trying to reconnect with our guest, Mr. Ashok Sajana, who is a former senior diplomat. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Narendra Modi spoke about various subjects pertaining to India's development and the upcoming elections in the interview with an Indian daily newspaper, Hindustan Times. PM Modi said he is committed to taking strict actions against the corrupt. Steps are being taken even in states where BJP is in power. He said that elections are the biggest festival of democracy in India. He further added that even opposition believes that NDA will return to power. 
slamming Congress, PM Modi said under BJP model, the priority is to strengthen the country in contrast to Congress model that focused on strengthening their family. He said that 25 crore people have come out of poverty and over 4 crore people have their own houses. He further said that this is just a trailer, a lot more work has to be done. Well, let's now get you the latest on world's largest democratic election in India. Well, notification for the election process on 94 seats in the third phase will be released on Friday. Voting in the third phase will be held on May 7th. In the third phase, voting will be held for 94 parliamentary constituencies in 12 states, union territories. Starting from today, the last day for filing nomination for the third phase of elections is April 19. The seats for which voting is to be held in the third phase include Assam, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Goa, Gujarat, Jammu and Kashmir and others. Also, there will be a separate notification for the adjourned poll in Madhya Pradesh, Betul. Well, senior BJP leader and Prime Minister Narendra Modi is now addressing a public gathering in Bama city in northern state of Rajasthan. Attending the rally, PM Modi was felicitated by party members on the stage. PM is in Rajasthan to support the BJP candidates. He will next visit Dausa city. Voting will be held in two phases in Rajasthan. Election season is at its peak in India, with parties organizing multiple public meetings as the first phase of voting is slated for the 19th of this month. In order to garner support for the ruling Bhatia Janata Party or BJP, Prime Minister Narendra Modi held rally in Jammu and Kashmir's Udhampur. Addressing the gathering, PM said that his government fulfilled promise of ending long sufferings of people of Jammu and Kashmir. सत्ता के लिए इन्होंने जम्मू कश्मीर में 370 की ऐसी दीवार बना दी थी आपके आशीर्वाद से मोदी ने 370 की दीवार गिरा दी मैं चुनौती देता हूं हिंदुस्तान की कोई पॉलिटिकल पार्टी हिम्मत करके आ जाए विशेष करके मैं कांग्रेस को चुनौती देता हूं वो घोषणा करे वो 370 को वापस लाएंगे ये देश उनका मुंह तक देखने को तैयार नहीं होगा and with the Lok Sabha elections nearing, political parties are ramping up their efforts to woo voters with leaders actively engaging with the public to garner support. Senior BJP leader and Union Home Minister Amit Shah held rally in Uttar Pradesh's Muradabad. During his address, Shah called Uttar Pradesh the major reason behind BJP's win in 2014 and 2019 general elections. दोनों में प्रधानमंत्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी बने उसका सबसे बड़ा कारण मेरा उत्तर प्रदेश है सबसे बड़ा कारण उत्तर प्रदेश 2014 में 73 सीटें और 19 में 65 सीटें दी और इसी के कारण मोदी जी पूर्ण बहुमत से प्रधान मंत्री बने मगर इस बार तीसरी बार बनाना है ना 73 चलेगी ना 65 चलेगी इस बार 80 की 80 सीटें नरेंद्र मोदी की झोली में जा well, the opposition parties are also going all out to woo the voters. Samajwadi Party Chief Akhilesh Yadav held his first election rally in Pilibi district of northern state of Uttar Pradesh. Akhilesh is scheduled to address rallies in Nagina and Bijnor. Congress President Malikarjun Kharge will hold election rallies in Kalaburagi and Bidar in his home state Karnataka to seek support for its candidates, while Rahul Gandhi will attend a public meeting in Tamil Nadu on Friday. 
Bahujan Samaj Party leader Mayawati will also campaign in Uttarakhand's Haridwar. Addressing a public rally on Thursday, Mayawati accused Congress of not implementing public welfare schemes during its government before 2014. Well, as the election preparedness gaining momentum, a significant deployment of security personnel in Marwa and Warwan areas of Kistwar district in Jammu and Kashmir on Thursday, jointly by District Election Office and Indian Air Force. In a unique voter awareness initiative, scuba divers in Chennai dove into sea, enacting the voting process 60 feet underwater. India and Uzbekistan exhibits their combat power and dominance in the joint military exercise. The fifth edition of joint military exercise Dust Lick between India and Uzbekistan to be conducted at Termes District, Uzbekistan from 15th to 28th of April. The joint exercise stage is a platform where the two armies hands to share and learn tactics. The 15 days exercise primarily aims at exchanging operational knowledge while enhancing interoperability between the armies of the two nations. All right, after a long wait of around three decades, an Indian movie would play at the upcoming 77th Cannes Film Festival. Writer-director Pyle Kaparia's All We Imagine as Light will premiere in the competition section. Kaparia had previously won the Golden Eye Award for Best Documentary at the 2021 Cannes Film Festival for her documentary A Night of Knowing Nothing. A joint production of India and France, the movie will be competing against Iranian filmmaker Ali Abbasi's The Apprentice, Francis Ford Coppola's Megal Megalopolis and Yorgos Latimos's kind of kindness. While rating agency Moody's maintained the outlook for the government of India to be stable, the long-term and short-term ratings of the government of India are pegged at BAA3 and P3. Moody's noted India balances its large and diversified economy with high growth potential. It also asserted that India benefited from infrastructure development, digitalization and rehabilitation of the financial system. Following a series of relatively strong growth numbers in the first three quarters of the financial year 2023-24, Moody's revised India's real GDP growth projection to 8% for the full year. The agency expects economic growth to be sustained at well above 6% over the next two fiscal year. And let's take a look at other stories making news. The National Investigation Agency NIA of India has detained two suspects from West Bengal in connection with the blast at cafe in India's Rameshwaram. The suspects have been identified as Abdul Mateen Taha and Musavir Hussain Shajib in IED cafe blast that injured many. While hundreds of devotees thronged in to witness the flag hoisting ceremony of annual Chitrai festival prevalent in the South Indian state of Tamil Nadu. Among the largest festivals celebrated in Madurai, the Chitrai festival is celebrated for over 10 days starting today. All right, and still to come on DD India News R. OJ Simpson, the controversial American sports figure, dies of cancer at 76. Football star was acquitted of killing his former wife and her friend in a 1995 case dubbed as the trial of the century. In Indian Premier League, third place Lucknow Super Giants take on bottom placed Delhi Capitals in Lucknow today. Stuns Erdogan with historic victory in Turkish local port. Will the defeat force Erdogan to reset his foreign policy? 
Will artificial intelligence enslave humans? And crypto king Sam Bankman Fried will grow old in jail. So, what lessons should we learn from his conviction? Watch Connecting the Dots to get the full picture every Friday at 8 p.m. IST on DD India. We just don't bring you the news as it unfolds. We get to the heart of the matter. We don't just present facts. We demystify complex social, political and economic events. We break stories that shape the world's present and future because you deserve the truth. I am Tanvi Taneja from New Delhi. I'm Oli Barrett from London. I'm Nick Harper from Washington DC. Join us on DD India Global Monday to Friday at these times. All right, you're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. The controversial American sports figure O.J. Simpson has died of cancer at the age of 76. Simpson rose to fame on the football field and remained in the spotlight when he was accused of murdering his ex-wife and another man in 1995. Ira Spitzer reports from Simpson's hometown of San Francisco. O.J. Simpson had a standout career as a running back in the National Football League from 1969 to 1979, followed by a successful foray into acting. However, he is best known for accusations that he stabbed and killed his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman in 1994 at her Los Angeles home. After Simpson was charged with the murders, he led police on a long, low-speed car chase around L.A. in a vehicle driven by his friend that was watched on TV by tens of millions of people at the time. Simpson was acquitted of the murder charges in a blockbuster, televised criminal trial the next year. The differing reactions to the verdict between black and white Americans at the time exposed racial fault lines in American society. The trial took place in L.A. with a majority black jury just a few years after white police officers were found not guilty in the beating of black man Rodney King, which led to the L.A. riots. Simpson was, however, found liable for the wrongful deaths of his ex-wife and Ron Goldman in a civil trial just a few years later. Ultimately, Simpson would serve almost nine years in prison after he was convicted of armed robbery in a separate incident in Las Vegas in the early 2000s. Reporting in San Francisco, Ira Spitzer for DD India. And you're watching DD India News Hour. Time now for Spot. Lucknow Super Giants will take on Delhi Capitals on Friday in match 26 of the Indian Premier League 2024 in Lucknow. And Lucknow Super Giants have made a flying start to their IPL 2024 campaign, winning three out of their first four matches. Their only loss came in the season opener. In stark contrast, the Delhi Capitals are languishing at the bottom of the points table. They have won just one out of five matches so far. Delhi will rely heavily on their opening duo of David Warner and Prithvi Shaw to provide a solid start. Tristan Stubbs' explosive batting has been a bright spot, but the team will also need support from their bowlers. And the Indian women's tennis team beat Chinese Taipei 2-1 in its third Billie Jean King Cup 2024 Asia Oceania Group 1 tie in China. On Thursday, Rutuja Bhosale won the singles rubber while the duo of Prathna Thombare and Ankita Raina prevailed in the doubles contest. India has currently placed third in pool uh, following two wins and loss in three outings. Meanwhile, China and South Korea are the first and second after winning all their three matches so far. The top two teams in the six-team Asia Oceania Group 1 competition will win promotion to the playoffs, while the bottom two teams will be relegated to Group 2 in 2025. India will next take on Korea on Saturday. Well, Israeli actor Sahi Halevi, best known for his Netflix Hebrew show Foda, sang a few lines from Hindi song Tujhe Dekha To Ye Jana Sanam from the super hit film of the 90s era Dilwale Dulanya Le Jayenge. Listen in. Mm -hmm. 
जन मर जाए हो तुझे देखा तो ये जाना सना Nice lines from Halevi. Well, that's all for this edition of Diri India News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on Diri India. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching Diri India News Hour.